Jensen. Hello, ladies and gents. Uh, welcome along to uh, this very special event this evening. Um, I'm very excited about this one, and it's great to see a real mix of men and women in the audience as well. Um, I think the... I was going to say the telly has been crying out, but I think the world's been kind of crying out for a series like this in terms of, of what she's trying to do with this. And, and I have been intrigued since I first heard of the American version of this a while back. So I'm very privileged and excited to chat to Amanda in a second. But before that, uh, this uh, show is going out on the new Lifetime channel. So let's have a look at why we're here tonight to talk to Amanda. This is the, uh, the UK version of the conversation. In all respect to the music industry, we're basically... The more naked we get, the more press we get, which is very depressing for me. I mean, ultimately, for feminism to win, when feminism is won, it will just disappear. And people will go, but why would you have needed feminism? Everybody's equal. When I started modelling, my agent told me to eat one piece of sushi and smoke loads of cigarettes and drink coffee all day long. Let's give a round of applause. Please welcome to the stage Amanda Cadney. <laughs> welcome. Thanks. Hello, everybody. For, does it feel slightly strange, this being the kind of flip side of, of what this whole thing's about? Of, of you yeah, being... you're interviewing me. It's really weird. <laughs> but I like there is a, uh, a, sign, a sign language interpreter down there. That's really cool. It's great, isn't it? Hi. It's awesome. Um, I, I've got to ask, first of all, where the whole idea for this started from, where it stemmed from, why you wanted to do it to start with. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think because I couldn't find media that represented women authentically. Everything that I was looking at uh, was some kind of like distorted version of what a woman's life looked like. It was going through like the publicist filter or, um, you know, like another editor's filter. It was always, it, it just wasn't honest. And so at the time I had uh, like, I had postpartum depression and I was really miserable. And I was trying to find stories about women that was, we had lived through this. And I kept like searching for stuff online and on television. And I was just coming up with nothing that was helpful. It was, yeah. all, it was all like, oh yeah, I had it, but now I'm fine. And I was like, well, where's the middle bit? <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you do to get better? You know, how did you live through this? And so the more I kind of investigated, the more I realized that the media that's created for women mostly isn't made by women, it's made by men for women and there isn't a lot of authenticity and truth. And so being the kind of person that I am, when I see that something's missing, I want to go and make it. So I sort of thought, well, if I'm being challenged by all these you know, issues in my life as a woman, there's got to be thousands of other women who are also dealing with the same stuff. So let's create a platform that is for women that is helpful, that is solution-oriented, that addresses all of these things that so many of us are dealing with. And how easy or hard was it to actually get it off the ground? Was it an easy thing to convince people um, to let you do? Well, was it easy? I mean, I really, what I did is I saved money working as a photographer, and every time I got paid, I would do an interview. You know, I literally, called up people that I knew. Some of them were well-known women that I knew had lived through an eating disorder, breast cancer, loss of a parent, um, you know, all these different challenges. And I, I sort of said, look, do you want to be a part of making something for women that can really help them as opposed to making them feel insecure about the fact that we're, they're dealing with these issues? Let's use your voice for something other than free handbags and promoting stuff. And you know, most of them said, yeah, great. Like, what is it you want to talk about? Yeah. And I said, well, it's really personal. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's really personal. And I want you to talk about the fact you had an eating disorder and, like, how did you recover from it? So it's all about solution. And quite frankly, the women that come on my show, it's a non-promotional show. They're not interested in, they're not plugging anything. Yeah. So they're only there because they actually, like me, want to create media that is supportive of women. Yeah. So it started off in the beginning where people didn't know what I was talking about. People said, oh, this has never been done. It'll never work. Right, you're going to talk to Lady Gaga in your living room about drug addiction. Yeah, nice, Amanda. And, and I did. Was it hard to convince her to talk about it? Did it or was, was it a kind of like, yes, straight away was, you know, as an example, was I she mean, an easy one to... I never really know what I'm going to talk about with people. I start with something, and I'm sure you find yeah. this, like you'll start with someone. 
but you know, we're on a subject. But the way that we all communicate and have conversations anyways, we'll start one place, especially women do this, and then we'll kind of go over there and talk about that, and then we'll come back around and talk about that same thing again. Then we'll go over there. And so I sort of listen to people rather than saying, oh, no, you, you've got to stay on this one subject. I just listen to what people have to say and let things unfold. And, you know, some people, I, I don't know that they're going to come out and say something. You know, it's a complete surprise to me. Yeah. But I, I just say, all right, all right, let's talk about that. You know, <laughs> let's go with it. Yeah. I'm going with what is. What's been the biggest surprise that you've learned through, do, through making these shows? I would say the biggest thing I've learned through doing, you know, I've probably have interviewed like over 60 women, at this, maybe 70 women at this point. The biggest thing I've learned is that we're not that different. Even though... Like on paper, you can look at it and say, oh, well, that person's really famous or that person has a lot of money or, uh, you know, that person's 70 and that person's 20. It's like if you strip all that back, the thing that I have observed is that we are so similar that it's made it a lot easier for me to, um, to connect with other women. Well, that's the thing that you know, from, from watching the shows, there's this common ground between everyone. Yeah. But there's also, you know, they also go off in, in different tangents with each person because each person's life experience has been completely different. Exactly. Um, and the UK show that you've, that you've done that's, that's launching, you couldn't have picked three more different women. Yeah. What, I like that. Yeah, it's great. What, what was the, what were you, you know, were they your first choices? What were you trying to get with, with, with the, the choices that you By made? By the way, I was going to say, like, I'm really sorry for the men in the room here that are like, going to hear a lot about women's lives, but the truth is this, is that I have a lot of men that watch my show. This is going to help you. I'm yeah, telling you. Yeah, it is. No, I have a lot of men that watch my show because if you want an honest insight into women, whether it's your mother, your sister, your wife, your friend, your girlfriend, whatever it is, like, this is a really interesting show to watch because it really is how women work and how they think. Um, so in answer to your question, how did I curate that UK show? Yeah. Well, I had a, I, in every episode, I like to have diversity of opinion. I also like to have um, as much diversity as I can in age, in socioeconomic background, in um, ethnicity. It doesn't always work out that way. My American series very much represents a cross-section of women. Mm. From On one episode, I might have Miley Cyrus and Jane Fonda. You could, I mean, that's like a 60-year gap there, you know? So I wanted that for the UK episode, but it was a lot harder to find women in the UK who were willing to be a part of the show because the nature of the show was to talk about very personal things and they were, people were very wary of the UK press and the, the kind of, the, the possibility that they could get really attacked yeah. for what they said. And we don't quite have that same problem with vicious tabloid press in America. So the American women were a lot more receptive and open to being on the show, whereas the, the English women were like, I really want to be a part of this. I really like this show. I think it's really helpful, and I want to support women and girls, but my life will just be made a living hell by you know, journalists in this country if yeah. I talk about my drug addiction and how I recovered from it, or if I talk about the fact I had an eating disorder, or if I talked about a miscarriage, or whatever the thing was, they knew it would be taken out of context and really used against them, which I found really sad, yeah. actually, that, that those stories aren't going to get told necessarily because of the fear of what tabloid journalism would do to their stories. It made me really sad. Um, however, Catelyn Moran, Rosie Huntington-Whitley, and Rita Ora were like, uh, my, they are really brave. You they know. didn't hold back. They did not hold back. No. And... Um, you know, their interviews are really candid, really honest. And, you know, Rosie, who's considered one of the most beautiful women, I thought it was really interesting. I wanted to talk to her. I'm not really interested in her relationship. I think, you know, again, let tabloid journalism deal with that. Yeah. I'm interested in who she is as a woman. And I really wanted to know <clears throat> what her experience was like with being judged for being beautiful. We've got a clip of that, actually. Oh, we're great. Going to show, yeah. yeah. First up, though, I want to show the Rita Ora clip because, you know, she's someone who you, you say, in the, the, in the, you know, she's a, a year pretty much, you know, a couple of years that she's been in the, the limelight, yeah. so to speak. And, and, you know, the way that the British press that you've mentioned, they, they very much create an opinion of someone yeah. that the public believe because that's what they read and that's what they see. 
Um, and I think she was incredibly brave in this and how candid she was about her background and her story and her experiences. And there's a great clip that we're going to show uh, right now of, of you and Rita. Have you found it challenging uh, finding suitable men to date as your life has changed and you've become more successful? Oh, man, ja. Oh, man. Because we were talking a little bit about, we were. about how women, as they become more successful and they start to have more of their identity, it's actually harder to find men that are accepting and supportive of that. Yeah. And a lot of my girlfriends have had challenges in finding partners who who want I mean, them me to keep succeeding and yeah. earning because they feel threatened by it. It is very intimidating. You know, money, it's money. Money is intimidating. Money can be scary. Money can be powerful. And once you find a set stone for you as like a woman and living a life and you have a career and you kind of are like independent, you don't rely on your partner or your family or whoever, that's because you are financially and mentally stable, you know? And when you're looking for somebody, you already have that bit covered. Yeah. So you're just looking for a companionship. You're kind of looking for a cuddle. And a lot of people have money, but not a lot of people can give good cuddles. Exactly. And everybody loves a spoon. It's true. You know. I bet you're a great spooner. I am. I bet you are. I've been told. <laughs> Amazing. She's so cute. But you have this ability to, to you know, there's a crew in front of them. You know, you've, you see the couch, but there's a crew there filming them. I remember this. Well, you have this ability to, what looks like anyway, to make people relax, to make people open up, to make people honestly answer the questions that you ask them. Well, yeah. I mean, yes. The, I have a very skeletal crew. Like, people don't, you know, I don't make traditional television men or women all women all okay. female crew um i like to give women job opportunities most of the time when you're doing a, t a tv show or doing a production and you need a grip and a sound person and you know a focus puller and you know an operator they're going to give you a list of like 50 men and you're like well where's the women on here and you get told frequently well there aren't any i'm like well of course there are get me women's names and i hire women so when you come onto my set, it's all women. And then the other thing that I do is I get everybody off of the set other than the people who have to be there. So I literally have four people in the room. I mean, I keep it pretty tight. And I think the reason why people probably answer my questions honestly um, is because they are there. They know what kind of show they're coming into. And I just don't think they can sit there and lie. I just, it's just not going to work, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's just not going to work. If someone sees the show, they know what they're in for. If they don't want to do it, then if they don't want to be honest, like, just don't come on the show. That's yeah. just the way it is. Has there been any, ever been a point where you've gone, I can't go there? Well, this, 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 when you, look, when I interview someone that I know really well, um, there are areas that I think, oh, God, don't, don't. Don't ask them that. And I get worried that I'm going to slip up and it's, I'm just going to say it because I know it and it's a natural progression of part of a conversation. But n no, I, I, I know what I... And you just feel it out. I mean, you know, you interview people, you feel it out, whether they're like receptive to what you're saying or whether they start blocking you yeah. and giving you the vibe of like, do not go there. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then you're like, all right, you just feel it out, you know? So no, no one's like stonewalled me at anything yet <laughs> no one's walked no one has walked. i'm more likely to walk off an interview by the way i'm more likely to get up and say i'm done with this interview We're not done. tonight please not, not tonight. tonight no 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 not with you what no. about what about though that that thing that you know how well you know people does that make it harder for them to be honest mm. or for you to make them be honest um, uh, well there's kind of like, I, I don't know every woman that I interview. I probably know about a third of the women that I interview. The other people I've never met before, they come on my set. So, you know, uh, Lady Gaga, Eva Longoria, um, well, Rita, Catelyn and Rosie. I didn't, had never met any of them before. Really? No, I had just met Rita like the week before. A girlfriend of mine introduced me to her and said, she sh you should interview Rita. Rita and Amanda, you'll get on really well. 
So I met her and I said, oh, do you want, you know, that's the first time I ever met her was a week before. Wow. So I didn't know her at all. Same with Catelyn, same with Rosie. So I don't know, I don't know them necessarily, but with the people that I do know, it, you know, it's really hard for them to lie to me. It's really <laughs> hard. If they start to lie, I sort of give them the look of like, you know, that's not true. And, you know, either I'm going to say something to you or you just better turn it around and be honest. So, you know. Yeah. I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow interviewed me for a special of the conversation that will be airing in like six weeks or two months, whenever, whenever I cut it. But it was really uncomfortable being interviewed by someone I knew so well. Why? She would, because she'd ask me questions that I knew she knew the answer to. You know, and I was thinking, why are you asking me this? You know what my answer is, and I don't really want to say it out loud. What was, it was the thing you were most scared about ans answering? Or that you didn't want to answer? Well, it was... I'm not going to even say it. it you'll it's see gonna it. It's going to be on the show. No, Come it's going to be on the show. But I, she said to me the other night, she's like, you've got to cut that out. <laughs> she's like, your answer was so bad. It was terrible, that answer. How could you even have said that? I said, I know. <laughs> like, it was really bad, my answer. Okay. But it might or might not end up in there. It was something to do with my favorite sex position. Okay, which you ask everyone anyway. I do ask everyone that. I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, well, it's quite interesting to see the reaction when you ask them it. That's, yeah. what, that's what I like. Yeah. Rosie particularly was really sweet. I know. Did you know you were going to ask me that? I, I know. Loved it, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to look at the clip of Rosie right now, actually, because it is really interesting, that whole idea that you got into with her about, you know, she's this perfect thing that's projected on, you know, billboards around the world and 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 how she relates to that in everyday life in terms of who she, she really is. This is really interesting. How do you reconcile with portraying an image of perhaps a person who's mm. a perfect person mm. to many with that being empowering for women? Well, how do you reconcile with that? It has really very little to do with the way I look. I hope that I represent somebody that has really worked hard and my, you know, and I've achieved my dreams and whatever your dreams might be that through hard work, determination and being able to pick yourself up and, and, and try, keep trying because it, it wasn't a, a sort of, for me, I think some people might think that it was this sort of easy journey and it, and it really wasn't, you know, and um, there was a lot of ups and downs and years where I didn't work a lot and, 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 and times where I had a lot of issues with my body and, 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 and all of that. And so... What were the issues with your body? I was shorter, I had braces, I had acne, I, you know... I Girl, if you got booked I, with, with all that I, going on, I, I mean... I, <laughs> I love how much she talks about chips as well. She loves French fries. She loves French fries. Yeah, she does. She's absolutely brilliant. I know. Well, you, we, you know, it is that thing where, you know, you know, us as uh, media reading and watching people, you have preconceptions of people because yeah. of what you see and what you read. And it's not our fault. No. It's just what we're being fed. But I think the, one of the biggest things that my show, I hope, does is, is pr prompts people to challenge the media they're being given. Because as a woman, specifically, you've got to think about, like, who's creating this media that we're being given? Who's telling us that we need to look like this, dress like this, sound like this, have a job like this, marry someone like this? Like, who's doing that? Who's creating that? And I think my show, what it does is it really strips away the veneer that we've all been sold and sort of prompts people to, to challenge it and say, well, that might not necessarily be what I believe. You know, I might not want that thing, you know, and I think that part of what I've done is to pick women who are high profile, who are willing to talk about the reality of who they are, as opposed to this image. And I can say that from my own experience of having been a public person for a really long time, there are some things that you can talk about that the press will not report on. They will not report on it. They don't want you to, to, to have that information out there. Yeah. But they will c perpetuate a lie endlessly because that's just better tabloid. It's like better, it sells more shitty newspapers. Yeah. So I can say from my own experience, I know what it's like to be misrepresented. And a lot of these women are misrepresented. And you'll see them on my show and you're like, oh my God, I had no idea that person was really like that. Yeah. Well, that person is like that in her interview. She's just, it's not getting reported accurately. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is 
accurately report women's lives? Because I don't see that happening anywhere. Um, the meeting of minds between yourself and Catelyn Moran. Oh my um, God, yeah. I mean, trying to get a word in edgeways with you two in a room must be kind of terrifying. I could barely get a word in edgeways. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. Like, and this, is, this is actually my show. It's actually my show. It's not like the conversation with Catelyn Moran. She was amazing. I was in heaven talking to her. You could tell. I mean, I was just like, it was such an amazing experience for me to talk to someone who speaks the same language as me, but who is challenging and provocative and funny. And, you know, I mean, I had just come off of, I did interviewed Gloria Steinem, um, who's such a feminist icon. It's like three weeks before. And she's very anti-porn. And I'm kind of on this whole obsession about how porn culture has infiltrated everyone's life, most people's lives to some degree. So I was asking Gloria Steinem about porn and she's very anti-porn very against it. And then I was interviewing Catelyn, who's a contemporary face of feminism. And she said, I watch porn. I'm not again anti-porn. I'm anti the porn industry. So it was really interesting to kind of get into a debate with her about these issues um, that, you know, that I'm interested in yeah. and the difference between like a contemporary feminist thought leader and a, an iconic feminist thought leader, you know, very different uh, school of thought around this one is issue. Yeah, this clip's great. It's it, if nothing else for you, for your you you can see that you just want to kind of con constantly talk to her about stuff. It's brilliant. Women wake up in the morning and immediately go, oh, I feel fat than I did yesterday. I should not have eaten that pudding yesterday. What am I going to wear today? Oh my God, look at my hair, it's really flat. The spot is coming through. I should have done my pelvic floor exercises. What am I going to do with the kids? This okay, is before they've even got okay, out but of the bed. <laughs> great. <laughs> I mean, what is not to love about Catelyn Moran, really? <laughs> She's so good. How long do you sit with them? I as, mean, each, as long as people want to. Really? Yeah, some people, it's like, some people, like, I interviewed Alicia Keys. She was half an hour late because she had a new baby and she was breastfeeding and whatever. She was late because she was breastfeeding, which is fine. And that's the only excuse that will really work. I'm sorry I was breastfeeding. I'm late. Um, <laughs> I had 20 minutes with her. And if you, when you see the episode, you'll have no idea it was 20 minutes. Some people, two hours. I'm like, can you go now? <laughs> you know, like my kids are coming back from school because I shoot in my house most of the time. Wow. So some people, I can't get rid of them. I'm like, all right, are you staying for dinner? Like, what's happening here? Because my kids come in and I have to, like, introduce my kids. This is so-and-so. Mama interviewed them for the conversation today. You know, it, it, it's, it's really... It's kind of random. See, that might as well, I think, must put people in a real kind of um, relaxed frame of mind ahead of, of chat you know the fact that you're you're welcoming them, them into to an environment that I imagine you don't share with people openly well I think look here's the thing I'm a working mother the reason why I set up my show the way I did is it's the only way I could make it work I had little kids three-year-old twins four-year-old twins and I did not have a budget to go and like you know rent somewhere to, to interview people so I, the only way I could work it out was to do it in my own house so it was kind of out of necessity that it was structured this way and it's worked in my favor. Because, but it's, it just always reminds me that if you think you don't have, you think you have an idea of what it is you need to do something. And I must have these five things to be able to, you know, start this job or start this project or do this thing. But you know what, even if you've got two of those things, you can start it and trust that you'll have what you need. It might not be the exact picture of the way you think it should be like me with my TV show. I mean, I shot it from my living room when my kids were at school because that was all I could afford to do. And it's one of the most special things about my show. So it just kind of goes to show that the thing you think is not going to work can actually be the thing that defines you. Yeah. Right, we've got time for a few questions from our audience. So if you have a question, please, can you put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Lady there in the bright orange jumper. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I'd just like to say that I've been following you on Instagram. and um, I What's your name? Uh, my name's Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Hi. And um, I just want to say that you've looked incredibly beautiful and amazing this whole week that you've been in London. And oh, that's been you. like so... I'm so tired. I'm surprised I look decent. Thank oh, you, you. You look amazing. And the photos have been really great as well because you can tell that you're busy and doing all these things. But it's, it's nice to see, you know, like you look so great. Um, one question. I'm absolutely addicted to the conversation. And um, I wanted to ask, the format from Series 1 to Series 2 was quite different. Yeah. 
Um, one, why kind of that difference? And two, with the, um, the online uh, snippets kind of from the latest series, uh, were there more, like, did you, did you end up with a lot more footage that you decided not to uh, broadcast? Or was it just a, a kind of a difference that you ended up with? Well, that's a good question. What happened with series one is that I had funding from Lifetime to, to make big shows. What happened with series two is that I did not have big funding, so I made little shows. Um, and my goal is to keep making the conversation, whether I can make it that's on TV, that's online, however I can keep interviewing these women and telling these stories, that's my goal. So my, the other thing that I have to do is I have to um, protect the integrity of my content. And so if I do a big deal where I kind of sell out and get a lot of money, but a network can like cut up my content and misrepresent my guests, it's not what the conversation's about. Suddenly we've got this other, this other thing as opposed to the honesty of the conversation. So that's why series two is smaller because I did not have funding to make big shows. So I, I had like a tiny amount of money to interview all those women. Um, and and there is actually more content that I could cut together, and and I and I will do that at some point. I will I will broadcast as much content as I've got at some point when I have when I'm not like making more shows. And I will remember that you said that. So thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, just a lady there. Um, hi, my name's Jane, and hi, I, Jane. I tweeted earlier about um, if the room was full of love. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yeah, Thank so you. It feels perfect. So, Thank you. Um, one of the things that really impressed me was my daughter just turned 21. Me and too. She, yeah, um, and uh, she introduced me to the conversation. And because oh. you and I are a similar age, I knew you from way back. And, and we watch it together. And that has been really special that Daisy's, my daughter Daisy, she's been... Um, She's like Jane Fonda. She was just obsessed afterwards. <laughs> She's actually just um, qualified as a personal trainer because she was just so into Jane Fonda. She went back and like looked at what she was doing. But my question, I follow people like Gabrielle Bernstein, Danielle Laporte, yeah. Chris Carr, uh, all these amazing American women. But in the UK, we don't seem to have that kind of voice. I know. And I understand what you're saying about the media, but these women aren't, those women that I've just named aren't really celebrities, but they're leaders in that kind of um, spiritual movement. Yeah. Why, why do you think that as, is, as a British woman who lives in America, why do you think we'd, we're missing that here? Well, first of all, it makes me so happy that you watch the show with your daughter. I mean, that's like, I specifically make my shows so that it's multi-generational, so that, you know, mothers and daughters, grandmothers and mothers, like all women of all ages can, can watch shows together. So that makes me really happy. Um, second of all, in answering your question, Gabby Bernstein is a good friend of mine. Chris Carr is a good friend of mine. And I've done and Danielle Laporte. I've done a lot of things about them on the, on the Conversation website because I, I admire them too. Um, now, the reason why I think there aren't perhaps women like that in the UK, or let me rephrase that. What, the, the reason why women like that are not highlighted in the UK, I think they exist. I think if you and I went away and for the next week we actually searched out who are those women, I think we would find them. I don't think the platform exists for them to be supported and heard and seen. I do think they exist. I also think that maybe America is slightly more progressive when, for, for people who don't know who these women are, Chris Carr is um, a woman who has stage four cancer but who is living a very healthy life. And she has arrested her cancer through diet, through, through nutrition, through lifestyle change. And she's phenomenal. She's a 36-year-old woman. Incredible. Gabby Bernstein is a... Uh, a yoga teacher and a spiritual teacher and teach people about, about meditation. They're kind of, they're sort of spiritual, you know, they're spiritual leaders in their field. I think that unfortunately, there is not as much support for people who think like that in this country. But there's no reason we can't change that. So, you know, I would encourage you to seek out who those people are. And you're on Twitter, you're on social media, you know, start tweeting at people to pay attention to them. I, I did actually tweak because I'm wanting. I have my own website called She Is the Revolution. Great um, title. I've I've met 
all the women that we've just been talking about and spoke with them. I've actually travelled to America so that I can go and hear them speak. Oh, wow. Um, and recently I put a call out for women who would help me with a book about body image, and I got nothing. Really? Um, I've done Blog Academy with Gala Darling. I know Gala Darling as well. I've messaged loads of people, and so if anybody here... You should speak to the Grazia girls tonight. Yeah, that, if anybody here can tweet me at she, she is Revolution about anybody that they know who might be interested, then that would be There's awesome, um, because I would like to have more engagement like this with British women. Yeah. Um, not that the Americans aren't great, but, you know. No, I agree. We live, I mean, look, it's important, it's important to highlight these women, you know, that they're, they are, they exist for a reason, you know, and they do a lot of good work. So, you know, regarding your body image project, you know, if no one's responded to it, I would, I, I'm not saying that this is the case, but I would look at what you're sending people because, there is a lot of body image projects going around. It's a really valid issue, one that I've dealt with myself and I talk very openly about. And I'm a big advocate for, you know, people creating their own awareness and awareness projects around this issue. But if nobody, if not one person's responded, I would probably look at what it is you're sending and maybe get some advice from people on how do you present a concept to people that you don't know. I suppose what I was doing was asking people to name people for me to get in touch with. Oh. And that's where I got the oh, tumbleweed. That, that, yeah, that, is, that so, does yeah, suck. That's that, the tumbleweed right, that's, part. I haven't even got, got to the part of pitching this, this idea. So, yeah. You but, can research that. Yeah, I will. But thank you very much for coming to the UK. Oh, it, thank we, you. We need more of you girls to come over and kind of lead thank the way. You. So thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Lady in the red. Hi, I'm Rosianna. And Hi, I, Rosianna. I want to ask how you found the reception different for uh, television and online content. No different. Really? No. I think that people consume content online. People are watching TV. They're watching videos. They're watching YouTube. They're, they're, they're consuming content via their mobile devices or on their computer. So it doesn't really make a difference, to be honest. The thing I love about being online, and I built the conversation.tv is the digital platform. We air all of the episodes, full episodes, extra clips, behind the scenes, everything lives on that digital platform, which we built simultaneously that the show launched. It's now in 18 different countries, in 10 different languages. So we're in South America, we're in Asia, we're in Europe. We're about to launch in, L in England. And women internationally have been able to watch this show online without having needing that specific network. So it's been kind of the same thing. Is that something you'd like to, to take further is to, to kind of, you know, your 18 different countries, did you say? It's to kind of go to those countries where women may not have as free and open a voice yeah, as, that's kind as of, the women that you, you speak that's to. That's the whole to. point. I mean, I get emails from women in Saudi Arabia saying they cannot believe that women can, can have permission to wear what we wear, to think what we think, to say what we say, to work in the way that we do. They just can't believe it. They didn't know it was possible. I mean, not just Saudi Arabia. I get emails from South Africa, from China, you know, Zimbabwe. I get letters from all over the world. Not letters. No one sends me a letter, an email. <laughs> Because I am accessible on, set, on social media and via the conversation website, people, I get my emails. And I love getting emails from people telling me how the conversations affected them because I made it for every woman. You know, I didn't make it because I had nothing better to do in my day. I've got little kids and a life. I made it because I really believe that these stories should be told and should be heard to benefit as many women as possible. So I love getting emails from people all over the world saying how this show, a television show, has impacted their life in a positive way. It, 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 it inspires me to keep making it, even when you know, I think, oh my God, like, how am I gonna keep making this? Because you know, I self-funded for a long time. I paid for this show myself. Mm. And I got to the point where I was like, I don't think I, don't think I can keep making this. <laughs> you know, I'm going bankrupt here. And it, it, inc no, it's not the, I'm not going bankrupt. That would not be a good self-care move to do. <laughs> but in the beginning, it was like, I don't know how I'm going to keep doing this. So every time I get an email from women you know, around the world saying how much they love it, it really makes me happy. 
Okay, time for a couple more questions. Let's go across here if we can. Lady in the green. Hi, Amanda. Um, Hi. I'm Ellie. Hi, Ellie. I l absolutely obsessed with the conversation. I discovered it when I was at university, and I kind of always felt that it was like the biggest sister that I never oh. had because it has so much great advice in it. Um, but my question is, I know that Miley Cyrus appeared in the American series, mm -hmm. and obviously she's undergone a bit of a metamorphosis since... That's very polite, yeah. Since, since you <laughs> yeah. interviewed her. Yeah. And doesn't necessarily embody the values that I feel the conversation... Yes. Um, kind of is transmitting mm -hmm. I wonder how you reconcile that and also how much of a responsibility you feel to pick women who do embody your values and and is that a difficult task that's a really astute question um you know what Ellie that here's the deal um I do feel a big responsibility to choose women that um that I want to highlight as role models one of the bigger issues I have is that the women that are put forward, the women and girls that are put forward as role models to us, a lot of them I don't think are, are particularly healthy. And it frustrates me that the media keeps putting forward these people and saying, these, this is who you should aspire to be. <laughs> I'm like, well, well, what about all these other women who are amazing? Like, can we just highlight them too? That's partly what I do. I never pick anyone who's in a crisis, ever. I will never interview anyone in a crisis. There were some women who were hugely successful household names who were in the midst of a crisis when I was shooting and who said, I want to sit with Amanda and talk to her about this. And I said, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm going to put you in touch with a good therapist. Um, you know, you need to sort yourself out. And in a year's time, like, we'll talk about it. Because the goal is to share the solution, right? That's the goal. The goal is... Not, I don't want to hear what the mess looks like when you're going through it. We all know what the mess looks like. I want to know how did you survive? Like that's the key thing for me. So I do feel a responsibility to pick women who can share from that place of solution. Regarding Miley, um, you know, she's a young woman. She's really expressing herself in a way that is is where she's at, and. You know, I can't judge. I I acted out in a similar way, you know, a few years younger than her, and I'm okay today. So it's part of her process. Do I think she's... Would I highlight Miley as a role model to young girls today? No, I wouldn't. Would I let my seven-year-old daughter see one of Miley's videos? No. Miley is off the iPod for the kids right now. <laughs> Rihanna, not on the iPod. Rita Ora, on my kid's iPod. You know, so, but you know what? Miley has been suppressed and controlled since she's a little girl. She's been told what to wear, what to say, where to go, what her feelings are. And her demonstration of right now is directly proportionate to how much she's been controlled. It's just a warning to me of like, do not try and control people to that extreme. And I'm sure she'll come through it. And by the way, let's not forget, she's extremely talented as a songwriter, as an artist. And the other thing I want to bring up is why is everyone pointing the finger at her when she was on stage with a 40-year-old man rubbing up against him? A 40-year-old married father, and he never got any crap. She's the one that got vilified as being slutty. But what about him? He's an old perv doing that to her. <laughs> That's just what I'm I want to so point out. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, come on. So like, glad you said is that. that? It, yeah. That's sexism. Do you think the, do you think it's ever going to change? Do you think it's I do don't, the balance look, in that kind of in, is that an ex, is that an example? As long is, as as long as people don't are quiet about it, no, it won't. As long as more people are not afraid to say, oh, "What's going on here? Why is she getting vilified?" and he's just you know keep on selling records. Like, what's going on here? So as long as in that specific instance. The more people speak up and the more and say, men or women, and say, I don't agree with this. This is not okay with me. The more we have a chance for it to change. It's going to take a really long time. We've been living in a patriarchal society for thousands and thousands of years. So it's, it's going to take time. But I do think that our generation of women and the, the generation of women that come after us have a different world that they're living in. It's more different than it's ever been. It's more of an equal playing field than it's ever been, but it's still not equal. So there's a lot to be done. But when I speak to, to, to young women, like my, I have a 21-year-old daughter, when I speak to her and to her friends, they have no concept 
that they're not equal. They have no concept of the fact that women are earning 77 cents every dollar a man is earning. They're, they're like, they're outraged. They're like, what are you talking about? I would never work. I said, you don't even know you're getting paid less than him for doing the same job. <laughs> you know? But like, they think, they, 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 they are in their lives thinking, we can do whatever we want to do. You know, yeah. we don't have these restrictions and limitations. Now, they're going to come up against them because they're still in place. But I think it's better than it has been. But there's a long way to go. Will you ever do a uh, series with men? Do what with men? Converse <laughs> I was like, hold on. It's a Scottish accent. Um, a series with men, conversation with oh, men. Oh, yeah, why not? I think, I mean, I love men. I, I'm married, I've got an amazing husband and I've got a son and, you know, I love men. Uh, I think that the, the, the conversation, um, not the TV show, just the conversation in general in life with men is really important, you know? I'm not for women being superior to men. I'm for equal, equality. Mm. And, and I'm really curious about men. I mean, I do interview, I host Chelsea Handler's show when she goes on holiday in America. And I interview guys and it's great. I, I mean, I ask them the same kinds of questions, <laughs> you know, and then also they're really not used to it. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh my God, you know. But absolutely, I'd love to do that. Who's on your wish list? Who's, the, who's a couple of names that you would love uh, to? I think um, Hillary Clinton. Great. Uh, I'm really after Hillary Clinton. I think I could do a really interesting interview with her. And I'm, Beyonce's on my list, but I'm shortly going to be interviewing her. Great. So I'm really excited about that. I love the way that Rita kind of compares her and her mom and the whole story I about know, their meeting. It's right? great. It's brilliant. We've got time for one more question, I'm afraid. Lady with the amazing hair right in front of yeah, us here. Yeah, beautiful. Gorgeous. Not just to describe you about the way you look. No, but you, your hair's incredible. Hair in. After years of teasing as a kid, it's actually nice to hear. Okay. Yeah. Um, Amanda, <laughs> I've, I've loved your work since I was a photography student about 10 oh, years wow. ago. So for me, it's a real thrill to see somebody that I admire creatively becoming a, a feminist icon in, in her own right. What I wondered is, for you, what do you believe to be the next, I suppose, frontier of feminism? Something that should be handled with the same focus, the same energy as, say, reproductive rights or, or working rights, you know, the way that they've been viewed in the last 50 years, what do you think should be the next frontier? You know, that's a good question. I can't really give you a definitive answer on that one because I think there's a lot of things. Um, I, would, I would say that one of the bigger issues I have is with maternal health care. The fact that women get such little paid maternity leave. That is a big issue for me. And I also think, by the way, that fathers don't get any paternity leave. Um, you know, people talk about equality, and I think that when it comes to raising children, the, the, the mother and the father have an equal responsibility. And if that's what we're asking for, then we have to support men to be able to take time off work, to actually support that they're the mothers to take care of the children. So that's something that I feel really strongly about. I also think that, you know, and it's interesting in talking to my daughter, you know, who's working, who's earning money, the fact that women are still earning less than men for doing the same job in this, in 2013 is incomprehensible to me. That is just like, what is going on? When I hear that, I'm like, what what age are we living in? And that here? it's in some contracts such as mine in, in my company, I hope I don't get anyone in trouble, that you, you can't even talk to your colleagues about what you earn. So you can't even make those comparisons. You can't even find out if you're at an, a disadvantage. That is that should that should change. I mean, what I feel is that as as a woman, you have to look at your life and say, what is not sitting well with me? What is a bias towards my gender that I'm not, I'm not willing to put up with. And what those, what those things might be for me it might be different for you. So I've always tried to link up with other women that have a, 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 a cause, a concern in that area and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? I feel really strongly <clears throat> about women being misrepresented in the media. I grew up in the media. I'm a photographer. I, I literally... I just did a photo shoot with Selena Gomez, who's a huge young star in America. And all of the young stars in America, the young girls, 
they hit this age where they go from being like a teenager to a young woman, and suddenly they're sexualized. They're in bikinis on the cover of magazines. And I refused to do that. So I, did a, I wanted to photograph her at this transition in her life. And I photographed her in a really beautiful, strong way that people will look at. They won't really recognize it as being her, but she's not sexualized. And I, I feel really strongly about my contribution of representing women in the media. Now, that may not be, that's not like a legislative movement, but for me, that's where I can have the most impact because I'm in the media. So I can impact the kind of imagery that we're all getting fed, whether it's television, whether it's imagery in magazines, whether it's articles that I write. So that's my biggest initiative is, you know, I guess it's regarding, you know, sexism. You know, that I feel really strongly about that. But you may have something else that feels, that feels substantial to you. And I encourage you to find out who those people are and to make contact because the strength in numbers. No, absolutely. Thank it's you. A great, great question to yeah. end on. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming You're and welcome. talking to I'm us I'm sorry all. if Thank I didn't you. get to everyone's questions. You can always tweet me. And I'll do go. my best, at Amanda Decadene, I'll do my best to respond to questions I didn't get to. And if anyone hasn't seen the conversation yet, then you need to, to get online to, to the online portal for it because there, there is so much up there and, and so many different voices with, with a connection for all of you in terms of what they're talking about. And the, the and UK special airs on Monday at 8 o'clock on, what is it, Sky, Life. Virgin, what is it? It's Lifetime Channel. What? There you go. I'm one, really five, numerically six. challenged, really bad. One, five, Can you tell six. me that? It's like, what? One, five, six. There you go. Okay. Eight o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on Halloween to sit and listen and participate. I really do appreciate it, and thank you for interviewing me. Amanda Ducardi, Thank everyone. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gents. Uh, welcome along to uh, this very special event this evening. Um, I'm very excited about this one, and it's great to see a real mix of men and women in the audience as well. Um, I think the, I was going to say the telly has been crying out, but I think the world's been kind of crying out for a series like this in terms of, of what she's trying to do with this. And, and I've been intrigued since I first heard of the American version of this a while back. So I'm very privileged and excited to chat to Amanda in a second. But before that, uh, this uh, show is going out on the new Lifetime channel. So let's have a look at why we're here tonight to talk to Amanda. This is the, uh, the UK version of the conversation. In all respect to the music industry, we're basically, the more naked we get, the more press we get, which is very depressing for me. I mean, ultimately, for feminism to win, when feminism is won, it will just disappear. And people will go, but why would you have needed feminism? Everybody's equal. When I started modeling, my agent told me to eat one piece of sushi and smoke loads of cigarettes and drink coffee all day long. Let's give a round of applause. Please welcome to the stage, Amanda Cadney. Welcome. Thanks. Hello, everybody. For, does it feel slightly strange, this being the kind of flip side of, of what this whole thing's about? Of, of you yeah, you're interviewing me. It's really weird. <laughs> but I like there is a, uh, a, sign, a sign language interpreter down there. That's really cool. It's great, isn't it? Hi. It's awesome. Um, I, I've got to ask, first of all, where the whole idea for this started from, where it stemmed from, why you wanted to do it to start with? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think because I couldn't find media that represented women authentically. Everything that I was looking at uh, was some kind of like distorted version of what a woman's life looked like. It was going through like the publicist filter or, um, you know, like another editor's filter. It was always, it, it just wasn't honest. And so at the time I had uh, like, I had postpartum depression and I was really miserable. And I was trying to find stories about women that was, we had lived through this. And I kept like searching for stuff online and on television. And I was just coming up with nothing that was helpful. It was, yeah. all, it was all like, oh yeah, I had it, but now I'm fine. And I was like, well, where's the middle? I mean, easy one to... I never really know what I'm going to talk about with people. I start with something, and I'm sure you find yeah. this, like you'll start with someone, but you know, we're on a subject. But the way that we all communicate and have conversations anyways, we'll start one place, especially women do this, and then we'll kind of go over there and talk about that, and then we'll come back around and talk about that same thing again, then we'll go over there. And so I sort of listen to people rather than 
saying, oh, no, you, you've got to stay on this one subject. I just listen to what people have to say and let things unfold. And, you know, some people, I, I don't know that they're going to come out and say something. You know, it's a complete surprise to me. Yeah. But I, I just say, all right, all right, let's talk about that. You know, <laughs> let's go with it. Yeah. I'm going with what is. What's been the biggest surprise that you've learned through, do, through making these shows? I would say the biggest thing I've learned through doing, you know, I've probably have interviewed like over 60 women, at this, maybe 70 women at this point. The biggest thing I've learned is that we're not that different. Even though, like on paper, you can look at it and say, oh, well, that person's really famous or that person has a lot of money or, uh, you know, that person's 70 and that person's 20. It's like a bit. <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you do to get better? You know, how did you live through this? And so the more I kind of investigated, the more I realized that the media that's created for women mostly isn't made by women. It's made by men for women. And there isn't a lot of authenticity and truth. And so being the kind of person that I am, when I see that something's missing, I want to go and make it. So I sort of thought, well, if I'm being challenged by all these you know, issues in my life as a woman, there's got to be thousands of other women who are also dealing with the same stuff. So let's create a platform that is for women, that is helpful, that is solution-oriented, that addresses all of these things that so many of us are dealing with. And how easy or hard was it to actually get it off the ground? Was it an easy thing to convince people um, to let you do? Well, was it easy? I mean, I really, what I did is I saved money working as a photographer, and every time I got paid, I would do an interview. You know, I literally called up people that I knew. Some of them were well-known women that I knew had lived through an eating disorder, breast cancer, loss of a parent, um, you know, all these different challenges. And I, I sort of said, look, do you want to be a part of making something for women that can really help them? as opposed to making them feel insecure about the fact that we're, they're dealing with these issues. Let's use your voice for something other than free handbags and promoting stuff. And, you know, most of them said, yeah, great. Like, what is it you want to talk about? Yeah. And I said, well, it's really personal. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's really personal. And I want you to talk about the fact you had an eating disorder and, like, how did you recover from it? So it's all about solution. And quite frankly... The women that come on my show, it's a non-promotional show. They're not interested in, they're not plugging anything. Yeah. So they're only there because they actually, like me, want to create media that is supportive of women. Yeah. So it started off in the beginning where people didn't know what I was talking about. People said, oh, this has never been done. It'll never work. Right, you're going to talk to Lady Gaga in your living room about drug addiction. Yeah, nice, Amanda. And, and I did. Was it hard to convince her to talk about it? Did it or was was it a kind of like yes, straight away was you know as an example, 